so we're going to get going. I want to welcome you to our, our third annual or our third Moving the Dial training. And uh, we really appreciate uh, the commitment that you have all had uh, to improving child welfare work here in Montana. And already since kicking off these trainings and starting some of the pilots and things that we have been doing, uh, we are seeing some positive trends in uh, much of our da data, which Marty's going to talk to you about in a, a few minutes. Uh, today, we are going to concentrate on uh, concurrent planning. And uh, as we were preparing for this, part of me kept saying, I I'm really hesitant that to present this as just a single topic, as if it's isolated or separate from all the other work that um, we are doing every day. And really concurrent planning is something, at least that I see it, it needs to be interwoven with the entire process of addressing a DN case. You know, from the time you initially, you know, explain to your client or the court explains to a client the federal timelines, uh, to the parents through every status and permanency hearing, we always need to be kind of considering if things aren't going well with parents, you know, what, what's the ultimate plan? And with parents, we need to be honest with them, if not you, who? And so, um, you know, little to nothing is gained by terminating parental rights if we have no plan at, for permanency and we don't have a placement for the child, uh, and we've just sort of left them blowing in the wind. So before we uh, kick off things uh, today with our guest speaker, uh, I am going to turn things over to uh, the Director of Child and Family Services Division, Marty Vining. Uh, she has some uh, data that she's going to share, as well as some concurrent uh, planning survey information uh, with you. So, Marty, I guess I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Justice Gustafson. Um, first of all, I would like to reiterate what Justice just stated about um, the appreciation that we have for all of your continued commitment to this moving the dial process. I really do believe it's innovative, it's exciting, and I do believe that we'll see better outcomes for children and families here in Montana due to that commitment that we all um, have towards improving child welfare. Um, Nikki is going to actually be the one today to review the data with you. Um, I've been out for the past four weeks um, on medical leave. And so actually today is my third day, partial day back. And um, Nikki has put a lot of work into making this um, happen today. And, and she really should be the one to present the data. Um, the only thing I wanna say about concurrent planning is I really firmly believe that when we take the responsibility um, of placing children into our system, that we have a high um, responsibility to make sure that we are moving children through our system as efficiently as possible towards permanency. Um, I really believe that when we fail to, to do concurrent planning, it's really truly the children that are affected. We all continue to go on, parents are moving on and doing what they do, but it's the kids that pay the price of lingering in foster care. So I just want us to keep that in mind and keep the kids at the forefront of our thoughts today as we hear Judge Wilcott talk about um, concurrent planning. So with that, um, again, thank you all, and I'll turn it over to Nikki, and thank you, Nikki. All right, um, let me share my screen here real quick. All right, so first off, I also want to thank uh, Center for States. Um, one, they put us in contact with Judge Wilcock, who will be presenting today, but also helped us really um, bring this, pull this data together. And so um, just wanted to talk to you guys a little bit about, we've, we've talked about some of this data before about our entry into foster cares, and it continues to decline as we've seen before. Um, and this data comes from our adoption and foster care analyst and reporting system, which is called ACTARS which we report our data twice a year to the Children's Bureau. Um, as you can see in the bottom of these graphs, you have 16A, 16B. That stands for you know, the year 2016. And then A is the April through September. And then B is October through March. So just to kind of frame what this data looks like um, moving forward. 
And so when we talk about permanency through the APGARS data, we talk about it in three different indicators, one being with kids that are finding permanency within 12 months of entry, and then the kids that find permanency within 12 to 23 months of entry, and then 24 plus. And so there is a lag in this first cohort because um, you have to wait for the kids um, who all entered throughout the year of 2019 to then start seeing if they receive or if they achieve permanency within 12 months of 2020. And then there's a slight lag once we submit it to the Children's Bureau to um, have it reported out in AFGARS. But as you guys can see, is um, Montana really is trending in the right direction. Um, one, we've had a decline of kids in foster care, but also continue to climb um, with kids having permanency within that first 12 months. We do have, in, you know, our internal data continues to support that in 2019, 2020, um, this trend does continue. Um, and we are uh, right, um, I guess we are above the national average. So the national average is 42.7. Um, so that is a positive thing for us. And so then we've um, taken the AFGARS data and broken it out between um, the counties that participate in moving the dial and all other counties. As we know, moving in the dial started here in November of 2020, but there's been a lot of work, like Judge Justinson said, um, that's been done over the past few years. Um, definitely since, um, you know, we think about the different interventions through pre-hearing um, pre conferences um, of some of the pilot courts, um, as Marty and I came into our roles, the work that we've done to collaborate with CIP. So we know that there's a lot of things that are impacting some of these improvements. Um, and we'll continue to track kind of the county separate um, moving the dial counties versus all other counties within this data to see if this, this intervention really has created a difference. Um, and so then that second indicator is that 12 to 24 months. So the kind of the, the positive things here is that the number of kids that are in this cohort have declined. Um, which is good at, while the outcome of these kids reaching permanency continues to incline or to, to increase. Again, we are just right around the national average of uh, 45.9, and we are at 45%. And so we want to continue um, really working on ensuring that kids um, that have been in care over a year get attention so that we can do what we can to find permanency for them. And then again, looking at the counties. Um, moving the dial counties versus other, all other counties, we see, you know, there's still a slight improvement within the moving the dial counties. I will just note that Dawson County um, was kind of just a statistical anomaly based on the number of kids there, knowing that there's a low number of kids. Um, so wanting you guys to look at this data, you know, as you're in your um, groups and kind of think through what that, what it means to you at your, at your local county level. And then the, the last indicator of kids that have been in care um, greater than 24 months. So this number has continually increased since 2016. Um, so also have the exits, the kids that are exiting. So the kids that are in this cohort that are exiting has increased, um, just not at the rate of the number of kids in, entering into this cohort. And so we have dropped slightly within that national or in, within that percentage to 38, but would say that we're still above the national average of 31.8. So um, obviously this is a group of kids we want to be thoughtful about um, and really think about what we can do to help um, them achieve permanency. And then looking at that indicator um, based on counties. And so one thing to think about, um, like when we see a decrease in flathead, there's always a piece of the numbers game within when you're looking at data. And so what this talks about, um, and just to use Flathead as an example, is in 2019, there was 46 kids in this cohort in Calis or in Flathead County, and 20 achieved permanency within that a year after being um, within this cohort of 24 months. So then in 2020, that number increased to 57 kids that were in this cohort, and 16 found permanency. And so even though there was only a difference of four kids that found permanency, because there was a larger group of kids in this cohort, um, it impacted what that looks like. So I think it's just really important that we continue to um, review our data, look at it and analyze it, and then apply interventions as appropriate. So again, like I said, just wanted you to kind of see this, um, this level of the permanency data for your area um, and for our state and see kind of what you, your takeaways were and what can your team really do with this data and what does it mean to your team? So as we move 
through today, um, really thinking about that. And then just wanted to talk to you guys um, and thank you. We've been doing a variety of surveys over the past year. And if you guys remember, we sent out a concurrent planning survey in December. Um, and many, we had about 200, or we had 215 professionals respond. So thank you very much if you guys were one of them. I know our days are super busy and to take time and do these surveys is, um, you know, it's a workload issue for you guys, but it's so important that we hear from you and have the information to really guide our decision making as we move forward. So about 30% were non-CFSD employees. So again, judges, attorneys, CASA, thank you for making time to do this survey. But it really helped us identify the focus for this moving the dial um, part three. That also talked about in the survey results um, that people had a good understanding about the concurrent planning and concurrent placement are different. Um, the majority of people responded that they understood that they were different. Um, in addition, the majority of people um, respondents understood that concurrent planning really should start at removal and that it should go throughout the life of the case. We also had a good understanding that it involves all parties, parents, relatives, tribes, attorneys, CASAs, everyone needs to be part of that concurrent planning. And so um, there was definitely a, an understanding of the importance, but I think it really gets to, and our hope is what we'll talk about today, is then how do you apply it? How do you look at what we know about concurrent planning and really apply it to really create um, better outcomes for kids and families? So with that, I will hand it back to Judge Gustafson to introduce the speaker. So thank you, you guys. All right, so there has been a question uh, in the chat room of can we get the PowerPoint information sent out? Uh, Julie did respond, but we will post all of our trainings on our website. So that data will be there as well as the presentations uh, that we've had in the past. So uh, just giving you that information. Um, our guest speaker today is uh, Ashley Wilcock. And she is a graduate from Tulane University with a bachelor's degree in uh, uh, English and psychology. She then attended Emory Law School. Uh, she's worked as a special uh, uh, attorney general in, Georgia, in Georgia's Department of Child and Family Services. Uh, she currently teaches trial skills for the National Institute of Trial Advocacy. Uh, she leads a program in Georgia on a cold case project, which maybe she'll tell us a little bit about. Uh, it's devoted to advocacy to children that are lingering in foster care. Uh, she also serves as a consultant with the Center for States uh, to assist child welfare agencies and professionals to help them build capacity uh, to strengthen and implement and sustain effective child welfare practices with, of course, the overriding goal, which is ours, uh, of improving outcomes for children and their families. And so uh, just to give everyone a little heads up, we're going to have kind of a two-part uh, deal this morning with uh, uh, Ashley Wilcott, uh, first presentation, and then a breakout group, and then some continuation on and some breakout groups. So there'll be time to chat, time to... Uh, discuss some of the ideas and things that are presented and how we could effectively use them in our um, judicial districts. And so uh, Judge Wilcott, I guess uh, a warm welcome to you. Thank you for uh, taking the time to be with here, us this morning and I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Judge Gust Gustafson. And hopefully you all can hear me okay. If not, let me know. I also wanna say thank you to Marty and Nikki for inviting me from the Child, Child and Family Services Division there in Montana. Um, you all are doing some great work. And just to give you a little summary of that wonderful introduction, it just means that I'm old, right? I've been in child welfare most of my career and I'm honored to serve as a judge pro tem in one of the metro counties in Atlanta. Um, um, I am a, a huge fan of trying to improve my understanding and my practice in court because old school was judges would come on the bench and let the attorneys do their thing and they'd, you know, sign off and, and get off the bench. And I think as child welfare has continued to develop, we really learn a lot about what's in the best interest of the children and really the, the emotional burden that all of us share when we're dealing with these particular cases because they're tough and they're uh, a lot of intricacies of the law of child welfare that we all have to apply and look at. So honored to be here today. Thank you 
you for the opportunity. I like pushback. I like interaction. So you all feel free to use the chat to raise your hand, to speak up, whatever you're comfortable with, because I'm not, uh, I'm hopeful not to bore you by just my talking and droning on. Concurrent planning is something that around the nation is a hot topic. It is a, um, sometimes I say in transparent discussion, don't say Ashley said, but I'm going to tell you this. Uh, concurrent planning is a popular tool by Children's Bureau and PIPs across the nation as ways to improve permanency. And the reason is because statistically it's shown to be effective. So we're going to get into that. I'm going to share my screen and I'm hopeful when I do so that my PowerPoint appropriately pulls up. If you all can give me just a minute. Somebody let me know if you are in fact able to see my screen and I'll put it in, good, thank you for the thumbs up. Um, I'm gonna put it in this format. So if something changes and you can't see it, let me know. But what we're gonna talk about in this moving the dial, love moving the dial, by the way, I think I'm gonna steal that for here because it's such a great way to denote the conversations you all are having. But we're gonna talk about the fact that the use of concurrent planning really does raise the bar in child welfare and statistically it has been proven shown to assist in achieving timely permanency and it's one of those topics that i think a lot of people feel like it's not about me whether you're the attorney the guardian ad litem the judge the agency but the reality is it's about all of us and the only way that we can help push forward permanency is to really push forward concurrent planning when it's appropriate so two pieces to the agenda, as, as already mentioned, I'll be talking about the why and the how of concurrent planning as part one, and then there'll be some questions and discussion that you all will have, and then I'll start uh, talking about the actual implementation and how to most effectively use concurrent planning in part two. So the how and the why, this is the agenda for our first hour, the CFSR and PIP process. All of you might be well familiar with that. Uh, you may not be, so I'm gonna mention that, touch on that. Also to talk about the program improvement plan, the PIP that the state's required to comply with. That's not just an agency responsibility, but rather the whole state has to work on those PIP items to then pass. Uh, the importance of the partnership, the stakeholders, the definition of what concurrent planning is, and then I'll turn it back over for your team breakouts with some questions. So the first is just about the CFSR and the process that's involved. The Children's Bureau administers a review system known as the Child and Family Services Review, the CFSR. That happens in every state in the nation, and there are uh, no states that truly that I know of just pass automatically and don't have to do anything, because there are always ways to improve child welfare and permanency outcomes for youth. And so states are assessed for substantial conformity with the federal requirements. So that's the standard, right? The CFSR looks to see, has Montana substantially conformed with the federal requirements for child welfare services? And whatever areas are found not to be in substantial conformity, then the states have to create a PIP. And the PIP in the goal is to improve child welfare services. So this is a very um, tedious, burdensome, burdensome process and I'm not judging, I'm not criticizing, it's just the reality. And I think that if you ask your child and family services division, they may nod and say, yes, it's a lot of work. A lot of time goes into it. It's a partnership between the feds and the state. And there can be some tension in that conversation to make certain everyone's on the same page. But ultimately, all of you on this call, I know for a fact, um, have to deal with child welfare and as a reality it's, it's important that it improves and you get the best outcomes possible. So Montana created a PIP and the goal of improving child welfare services and one of the areas of concern identified in your state and this is true in many states is to achieve more timely permanency there needs to be effective use of concurrent planning. Most States have concurrent planning of some type and Montana obviously does as well, but you really have to focus sometimes on the effective use of because in practice, there are many communities, many regions, many districts, many states that don't know how to do it effectively. And so what I am finding nationwide is 
This is not intended to be a, let me tell you how to do it, because that's not useful to you. You know your state. You all are the experts. When I need something in Montana, I know to call one of you because you are the experts. So the reality is effective use of concurrent planning always needs to be thought of as a continuing dialogue, a continuing conversation. And if that doesn't happen, in my experience, it will never be effective use. And I will tell you that when I first started on the bench, I really viewed it as, all right, DFACS, our state agency in the state of Georgia, you come up with your concurrent plan and you do the concurrent planning and then present it to me in court. Let's see if all the attorneys are in agreement. If not, why not? And then I'll sign off on the concurrent plan unless there's some valid reason not to have a concurrent plan. But the reality of what I've learned is, and, and again, I'm not criticizing, but all child welfare agencies do have turnover, do have uh, needing to train new workers. And I don't care how good training is for new workers. It is a whole different beast to be there at the ground level doing the work than to go through training to learn how to do the work. Because all of our families have very specific issues. All of the families can be difficult to work with sometimes. And the reality is it's a discussion concurrent planning that needs to happen not only between the, and I, somebody may be off mute. We still remember. Even though we have you. I'm going to give you just a minute. I think Ms. Hatfield, just so you know, it looks like yours may not be on mute. All right, guys. And I'm not sure, I don't know how to put her on mute. So someone else may be able to do that. Um, in any event, the effective use of concurrent planning really requires dialogue in the courtroom by the judges. It requires attorneys representing children and parents to say, what about concurrent planning? Is it effective in this case? Is it useful in this case? Of course, it's objective for every case because the composition of families and family issues, as you all well know, is very different in every case. But the more concurrent planning that's effectively used and the discussions being had, the more likely a child is to reach permanency, whether it's reunification with a family or kinship to or guardianship to a relative, because the caretaker can't get it together, isn't in a position to do it, um, hasn't successfully treated or, or remedied whatever the deficiency in their caretaking capacities are. Well, then you have a relative and all the legwork's done so that when it's time to say, all right, reunification is not appropriate, instead of then saying, let's consider this relative and look six months, 12 months out before that can be done, that relative is ready, willing, and able, and the conversation's been had with the parent so that it can happen more quickly. There's no reason for this child's sake not to have a plan A and a plan B at the same time. And it can be tough conversations. We'll get into those specifics in the second hour, but the goal is to really remember all stakeholders need to be driving this discussion. And let me just stop there and look at chat. Any questions, any comments? And again, this is meant to be a transparent conversation. So I certainly respect if any of you say, it's not effective from my perspective or it's not working in my court or it is working and here's a suggestion I have. All right, I don't see any comments in chat yet, but feel free to add them. So the partnership specifically needs to be for any effective concurrent planning between the child welfare agency, child and family services, I know is in tune with concurrent planning. They're one of your partners, all of your attorneys, again, whether they represent the parents or the child or the children, the court improvement program, the judges, you, and the CASA's guardian ad litem. All of these individuals need to be involved in the conversation in order to raise the bar. And I am gonna tell you what I always think of it as is a triangle because sometimes, um, and I may be preaching to the choir, have you ever made a decision in a case and someone's unhappy with it? Mm -hmm. And so sometimes you have to say, well, the reason I made the decision in the case is because of the evidence that was presented to me and as the judge, I can only consider the evidence that I heard. And if, for instance, an attorney fails to present evidence 
because they represent a client who handed them all the documentation that morning of the hearing and all the other parties. Hey, we've had this continued three times for that attorney to be prepared with that documentation and we haven't seen it. So we're objecting to a continuance, but we're objecting to it coming in. And if I find under the valid rules of evidence that it can't come in, and I don't have all that evidence, well, then I have to make a decision on what I have. We all do, that's the nature of our job. And so part of what I try to drive home here with attorneys is, listen, concurrent planning can help, but if I don't have all of the evidence, all of the information to make the best decision in the best interest of the child based on the laws in my state, then I'm, I'm, I'm not an effective judge. So I look at it as a triangle and the triangle is at the pinnacle of that is the court because ultimately you're the one burdened, and I mean that in a positive way, burdened with making the decision in the best interest of the child or children. Also at one of the corners, you have the attorneys, because again, you can't make the best decision if all the evidence isn't presented and presented in the way that it's not gonna be overturned on appeal because it shouldn't have been admitted in the first place. And the other corner of that is the agency because the agency are the frontline experts. They have all the information about that family since the get-go. And yes, their frustration with child welfare agencies. And yes, people say they're overwhelmed. They don't do enough of the work. They don't make all of the reasonable efforts that they should have. All right, we get it. Those are all the systemic issues that child welfare across the nation faces. But the reality is if all three of these angles can focus on concurrent planning in each case to see if it's appropriate and if so, how to drive it forward, it's gonna raise the bar. That triangle is gonna move up. And not only is child welfare going to improve in your state, permanency outcomes, I will tell you for a fact, we've seen it here, we've seen it across the nation. Effective use of concurrent planning means those permanency outcomes not only increase in terms of having permanency for a youth or a child, but also in terms of the amount of time it takes. You just heard some of your statistics about the 12 months, 24 months. When a child's been in care 24 months, statistically, they really start to languish and it gets harder and harder for whatever reasons to get them to permanency. So with concurrent planning, you can avoid getting to that 24 months in some cases, and it only benefits the child. Now, I'm not suggesting that concurrent planning is appropriate in every case, it's not, but I am suggesting the conversation should be had and looked at from the get-go of every case to determine whether it's not, whether or not it's appropriate. The other thing I wanted to share is the AFCAR data, AFCAR's data, always said that wrong, and the nationwide frustration that there's a lag necessarily in getting that. And so to see the results of what Montana is doing favorably or not takes time. And that's true in every state. And so I just wanna highlight that it's clear from your data that you can see that Montana is moving forward in a positive way and a positive impact on child welfare. Um, congratulations for that, that's fantastic. The reality is to see the hard data is going to take two years before you're going to get all of that to really see what the statistical analysis looks like. I'm just sharing with you that that's true all over the nation and there's conversation around that so people realize that it can take some time to get all of the statistics to reflect what you're doing as a state. I'm going to look in the Oh, this is a great question from Kelly about, and I hope you all don't mind first names. I'm Ashley. If you do, let me know. I'll call you something different. But um, just pointing out that the statistics were for the 12 months and concurrent planning seems to focus on the first 12 months, but why not the first 15? And I'm assuming your first question, why not the first 15, is uh, around the 15 out of 22 months compelling reasons why not to follow TPR or else you have to file a TPR? not to put you on the spot, but is that kind of your question? Yes, that was. Okay, so, you know, from my perspective, those are two separate issues. And yes, it's correct that 15 out of 22 months, you either have to have a TPR filed or the agency has to prove to the court why there's a compelling reason as defined in Montana as to why the TPR is not filed. But concurrent planning, the focus of 12 months is because you should really have a plan. It, it shouldn't have to get to 15 out of 22 
to file a TPR. You should know prior to that, prior to even the first 12 months, exactly what the plans are and the best plans. Maybe it's TPR, maybe it's not. And so the focus is really on the first 12 months from my perspective to move the ball back and say within those first 12 months, we need to have effective concurrent planning and an effective permanency plan that may or may not include that TPR that has to be filed at 15 out of 22. But let me stop there and sorry to do it to you, but Nikki, let me and Marty, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit to see, do you have any additional information from the agency perspective in response to that? And they may not have stayed with us. I just realized that they may not be with us. Judge, Judge Wilcott, I, I'm here. This is Marty, and I don't have anything to add to that. I thought okay. the response was exactly where my mind went. Okay. Thank you for piping in. Sorry, I do people on the spot inadvertently, but I like the, the discussion questions. Another great question, and this is a question that comes up in lots of states. So the second question is, why this timeline? Um, we know it's required by the feds, but why? When we all know the statistics and problems with drug treatment, mental health treatment, especially the trauma-related mental health issues, and we know that can take longer. Very good question. Um, I'm also going to add to that, we know nationwide, and Montana's no different, you don't have as many service providers as you'd like for effective drug treatment and mental health issues. Ideally, there could always be more. There are always new uh, tweaks to mental health and drug treatment programs based, based on new findings, new science. So trauma is now, it's always existed, but they're just now talking about it scientifically so that it's becoming an integral part of a lot of these treatment, which is so important. Kids that we think, oh, they have ADHD, it could be that it's trauma they've gone through and affecting brain development and affecting their behavior. So a lot of that's now coming into these treatment programs. Um, I can't answer for the feds, because you're right, it's a federal requirement. And I can tell you, and we're gonna get a little bit into it, but let me mention now ASFA, the Adoption Safe Families Act. And you know, this was in the 90s. And the whole reason they put these timeframes in the 90s is because they found, and I know you're talking about the trauma of parents, so I am going back to that, thank you, and how long it takes the parents to get the treatment. So in the 90s, ASPA and the Fed said, looking at all the statistics, this isn't fair to children. We're seeing them in foster care for way too long. And the reality is the longer they're in foster care, the worse the outcomes are for them. So we've got to make stricter time requirements to get these children out of foster care to appropriate permanency. And so they didn't look at it from the perspective, in my mind, of the amount of time it takes to treat parents for mental health and substance abuse but rather the Fed said, we're gonna look at it in terms of the best interest of the child. And a little bit of regardless of how long those programs may take, we need to focus on the children. And that's when they put these timeframes into place, 15 out of 22 months to TPR. But the reality is they then did turn, and ironically, let me just segue from the 90s until 2021, we're, dealing, we're talking about the exact same issues. Nothing's changed. We still don't have the rates of permanency that ideally we'd like to see for youth and children. We still don't see parents completing the mental health and substance abuse treatment like we'd like to see. But here we are, ASPA still regulates 2021. Maybe there needs to be more conversation about what's best for parents who have identified substance abuse and mental health issues. Should they be allowed longer? But the reality is there's still this answer out there, which is, if you get a parent to the right type of treatment, so for instance, if they need inpatient treatment, that they are given inpatient treatment from the beginning versus outpatient alcohol and substance abuse as a random example, that if they get into that inpatient program and if they choose to do it, not because you ordered it as a court, because that's a difference as you well know, but because the parent says, I truly want that treatment to get my child or children back, that theoretically 15 out of 22 months is sufficient time for them to finish that substance abuse program and have some time to comply to remain drug free and get a support system in place. Drug court has the same time frame. So 
it is sufficient time from a federal perspective, so long as it's the right type of treatment and so long as the parent is committed, even with relapse, even with the things we know can happen, to staying in that program. I just handled a case that um, is one of the most difficult I've had because a mother has schizophrenia. So we're dealing with obviously a severe mental health disorder. When she is not on her medications, one of her behaviors is beating her children, one of them almost to death before they came into care. So we know it's a mental health issue for this mother. She has gone to, I mean, talk about a model citizen in terms of treatment for mental health. She did everything. She went to everything the Department of Children's Services asked she did. But here's the reality of what happened. As happens with mental health needs, she got through everything. She was taking her medication. She was engaged in parenting with her children during observation. She advanced to unobserved. And so the, the, what happened is it was time for me as the court to consider returning her children to her. But regrettably, as often happens with mental health, she went off her meds. She didn't like the way they made her feel. So when she came back to court, it was obvious, belligerent, angry, throwing things, having to be restrained. Her behaviors were obvious that she wasn't on her medication. She could no longer effectively parent her children. She lost her capacity to parent because she chose to go off her medications. That's an aspect. I'm not saying it's a choice. Mental health issues are not a choice. I understand that. But the reality is I had to look at that point in time and say, can she effectively parent her children right now? No. So we have to go back and try again. And so I think something to remember with concurrent planning is with mental health and substance abuse issues, no one can necessarily cure the parent. They're always gonna have mental health issues. They may always struggle with substance abuse, but it's that point in time, have they done enough? Have they substantially complied with a case plan, with a court order to be able to say they have the parental capacity to have the children back at the home and the children won't be at risk? Very long-winded answer. Uh, let me look at the chat. Oh, it's exactly what we were just discussing. I think it's important to remember that in these cases, we're not asking for the parent to be cured. We're looking for enough progress for them to be able to safely parent their children, uh, while some of them will require years of follow-up treatment. Thank you for that comment. And the reality for you to always keep in mind that um, we all have our stuff. I've got three teenagers and I jokingly sometimes say, but I'm serious, I wish I could have a parent aid because all families have their stuff. It's just, is that stuff such that it's creating harm for the children to be in the home or not? So Judge My Wilcott, well, I mean, just to give you some, a little background, one of our last uh, Moving the Dials, we talked a lot about substance abuse issues and whatnot. And also I think combined with it is educating folks on, on substance, things like substance abuse, how to treat it and what reasonable expectations are because I think some of the model or some of what has happened over time with us, it, it was that we would say, well, you've used drugs, you're just unsafe, we take the child, and then, you know, they go to treatment, they do the things that they need to do to address that, relapse being part of recovery, right? They, there's a relapse, and it's seen as a total failure, re-removal, and so you develop this system where you remove the children and wait like two to two and a half years to say, well, we're, we're waiting to see how you're doing. And I think, you know, sort of the other component of things is how do we move, you know, recognize we can move children back into homes while people are getting treatment, uh, depending on their level of stability and assist them in addressing the adversities that they're going to face with and the increased stresses they're going to face with children in their home while they're addressing it. I mean, you know, parents who have lung cancer and other bad diseases, their children are part of their lives while they're treating it. And I think uh, for a long time, which is changing now, but there's been a disconnect really that you have to go get all better and not have any more relapses. And then after you prove that to us, we can return your children. And I think, you know, we are moving the dial, so to speak in that education as well. 
And I so appreciate that because we're doing the same here where I am. And I can tell you some other states that are grappling with that same issue. And that I think across the nation, we can tell you that the norm has been to think that parents' families have to completely cure their substance abuse or mental health issues or completely do every single thing before we want to take that risk, we being as a system, the risk to return the children. But the reality is it's that balancing act of have they substantially complied and are the things they've done enough in order to make sure the children are safe. We returned a couple of children recently that um, I think in the past five years ago would not have been returned, but there were some differences. There was a relative that was coming in and checking on the children and the guardian ad litem and the department division were going to be going and checking on the children twice a week. And then we had some other in-home substance abuse counseling being provided. So I do think now we're also getting to the point of uh, services are a little more flexible and defined in a way that they can really be tailored to meet the needs of the, the family or the parents who are suffering from mental health or substance abuse to then get the children back home. I'm really hopeful that COVID, one of the silver linings of a terrible pandemic is that things like telemedicine and, and virtual visits, while it's not effective all the time in every case, certainly can bolster the connection with family having children reunified. So that's the hope. Thank you for adding that. Um, you know, I talked to you, I'll, it's no secret, I spoke to you before um, coming and, and speaking to this whole group. And I said to you, to see the progress in moving the dial conversations that you all are having, entertaining, discussing, putting on the table, uh, warms my heart because it moves your system forward in such a positive way. So let's talk about the definition of concurrent planning. I mentioned ASPA to you in 1997 is when that became federal law. And it's the simultaneous pursuit of two permanency plans to reduce delays in achieving permanency for the child. How do you do that effectively? We'll talk about in the second hour, but I wanted you to have that definitions. And further, it goes to state efforts to place a child in an adoptive home or with a legal guardian can be made concurrently. And some argue, well, that's not fair to a parent. If they've got all these issues, why would we even have this conversation? Because they're gonna take it as, I might as well give up because you're gonna adopt my child out anyways. And the reality is, it's why you have to have the conversation from all sides, why the agency, the attorneys, the guardian of the the courts all have to have the conversation because it's true with anything in life. Theoretically, we should all have a plan B. It's why people have wills the plan B. So no parent, we are absolutely here to support you. I as a judge want you to have your children back in your home, but there are federal laws, there are requirements. We need what's best for your child. And the reality is as we, as you have zealous representation from your attorney and you have court ordered items to be completed, the reality is if you're not able to do those or willing to do those, then without some good reason why not, then we're gonna to have to look at a plan B and having a plan B is a safety net because we never know what's gonna happen. That's a hard conversation to have, but it's a conversation that's really necessary. Uh, let me look at the chat in terms of an important aspect of concurrent planning is identifying potential options. Excellent point, thank you, Gail. Preferably family who are not only willing and able to be a permanent option, but are willing to be educated about the parent's particular challenges, but demonstrate commitment to supporting the parent. That is such an excellent point. And part of the thing, part of concurrent planning that's from the get-go is the diligent search efforts. And diligent search efforts can get stalled out. Parents are angry their kids have been taken away, so they don't want to tell even the court who their relatives, friends, and family are. So the diligent search has really become something that, that the agency is required to do a deep dive, and that's another part of the concurrent planning. The court needs to do the deep dive. Okay, mom, dad, you're testifying. Is there anybody else 
that you haven't told anyone about that might be a resource that the child has visited with, that this child calls aunt or aunt or uncle, but isn't biologically related to? Is there someone that cares for this child every afternoon because you have been working, which is great. Who takes care of the child after school? Having these conversations with them to continue to bring it up to help identify those people that you've just identified. I, you know, I'm sure it happens to you all as well. And it's never any one person's fault. But the reality is I'm on a case right now, two years down the line and a grandparent's come into court and said, I had no idea my grandbabies were in foster care. Two years, it's been two years, two years. No one person dropped the ball. No one person intentionally said, we're not gonna consider the relatives, but the conversations haven't been good enough and the diligent search efforts have flopped. And here you have grandparents who are available in another state. Fantastic. Mom doesn't want the grandparents to have the child, but mother hasn't been able to get it together. And the reality is they're in another state. So I see PC add six plus months at a minimum. So all of that to say, excellent point. That's a very important piece of it from the beginning. I know you all know this, but I just wanted to include specific to Montana. It permits concurrent planning and I did uh, Cite your code 41-3-4236, talking about reasonable efforts. And at the end of that in red, the reasonable efforts to place a child permanently for adoption or to make an alternative out-of-home permanent placement may be made, and it's not shall, it's may be made concurrently with reasonable efforts to return a child to the child's home and concurrent planning may be used, but again, just to your point, it means including identifying in-state and out-of-state placements from the beginning that can support the family, that can support the parents, that can support the children, that can understand the benefit to them being there from the beginning is then they get the whole picture of what's really going on. Nobody knows what's really going on with their kids sometimes. And so the reality is if they're identified at the beginning, they're more privy to that information to have a better idea. One of the things during your discussion that you're gonna be having, I want you to think about, do you all think, is it something to consider that Montana should include shall in the legislation? Should concurrent planning be mandatory? That's just something for you all to think about for your specific state. All right, in the chat, it looks like we have a new message. Uh, I would love to see providers doing in-home chemical dependency services for families. Transportation can be a real barrier due to distances and lack of public transport resources. Um, this is amazing that the department staff will drive parents to appointments um, due to those issues. I know that can't always be done. And I don't know if Montana has uh, transport services. I know throughout our state because South Georgia is very rural, so it's long distances and many people don't have transportation because although we know poverty cannot be a cause of dependency, poverty is an issue uh, period in our state and especially in South and North Georgia. So do you all have independent transportation services that only provide transportation? That's just a potential resource and you may not because the in-home in chemical dependency services makes a significant difference in those cases in which we're able to get it here. So it's just something to think about. You know, and I have to segue and say, I regret this is not in person because Montana is beautiful and I would have really been honored to come to your state to do this because it would be a great reason to come visit. All right, let's talk about concurrent planning and the goals. So again, the how and the why of concurrent planning and what is it, the definition. You know, it's expediting sustainable permanency through reunification, kinship care, adoption, guardianship. It is to minimize the child's separation from parents, relatives, caregivers, while maximizing the attachment and the permanent connection. So you want that amount of time to be as minimal as possible. Concurrent planning is really significant when it comes to keeping siblings together because often resources such as foster homes may not have room except for one or two kids and there may be six siblings, but often relatives may be the ones that are more willing to say, I'll take all six. I want all six of these to stay together. Concurrent planning is to work on that. And sometimes parents, if they understand that, well, there's a relative who's willing to take all six, but unfortunately our foster care homes, we may have to split the siblings just because of the space available. 
the parents may be more inclined to understand this doesn't mean you're not working on getting these children back. It doesn't mean we're not here supporting you getting your children back. Rather, it means maybe they can be placed with a relative so they all six stay together. And then if the parent is unable to do enough for the children to be reunified, maybe we don't have to TPR. Maybe then we can do kinship guardianship, whatever tools are available. Um, another goal is to empower parents by, and this is from the Child Welfare uh, Information Gateway from the Children's Bureau to give you an idea of where I'm getting this information. Empowering parents. Parents want to be heard. A lot of parents I see, they know they're not the place to take care of their children. They know that they're strung out. They know that they don't have the ability to, or temperament, to deal with three kids under the age of six, all of whom have behavioral issues. They know they're not equipped for that. So sometimes I find if parents engage in the conversation, they're relieved not because they don't love their children. They always love their children, not because they don't want what's best for their children, but they recognize they're not in a place to care for their children. So as a result, engaging them in that conversation about, it's so, we all have our stuff. It's okay to not be in a place, but let's get your children safe while we work with you on what you need. Everybody needs help sometimes. Case plans are no different. Here's some help. We all need help. Let's get you the help to get your kids back. But in the meantime, let's talk about the family. Because remember, first placement theoretically of a child should be the last placement outside of the home. So if they can go to the relatives initially from the get-go by empowering parents to involve them in the decision and understand why, I have families say, uh-uh, I don't want that my mom to have these kids. She's crazy. I didn't like the way she parented me. Well, it may not be that she's crazy. It may be the reality of they butt heads because their child parent often butt heads. So they need to be empowered to recognize why it may be a good idea to have a concurrent plan and how it can help these parents. It's, it's also something that helps the parent. And, and the more educated our attorneys can be about explaining that to parents, the more likely it is to have the voice of the parent at the table to work on the concurrent planning. Also to communicate with parents directly at intake and throughout a case. And that happens by the agency. And I know Montana's aware of that, privy to that, working on that. I have the opportunity to speak first and foremost with your division. So they know that, but it has to be done not just by the agency, but also by all of the other stakeholders that are involved and touch that child's life. So it can be a plan that gets worked. Therapy. Therapy is the best place for parents to really have some good active engagement and voice and understanding of a concurrent plan or understanding, I don't understand, why are they talking about my relatives when I want my babies back? Nobody else needs them, I need them. Therapy can sometimes help address, yes, that's true. They should be with you. We need to get you through these things and help you do that. But in the meantime, we need a plan B in case this doesn't work, in case they're not able to come back to you and what's that plan B. So therapy is another great resource for dealing with concurrent planning. Montana, you know this, defines concurrent planning, means to work towards reunification of the child with the family while at the same time, and I wanna highlight that, while at the same time, develop, whoops, I didn't highlight it, I moved inadvertently, apologies. Um, while at the same time developing and implementing an alternative permanent plan. That's concurrent planning. Now you'll see it doesn't say, um, while at the same time the agency develops or the division develops and implements. It doesn't say, while at the same time the attorneys develop and implement. It doesn't say, well, at the same time the court develops and implements. Why? Because it's everybody's responsibility that's dealing with that child. And again, I just challenge you in your discussion to think about, is this language current? Does this language fit? You, you're the experts, you have your expertise. Again, when, when Ashley calls and says, I need help in Montana, you'll know why I'm calling you because you have the expertise. So is this the best definition? It's your current definition, but maybe there needs to be discussion about if this is the best definition. In the meantime, this is the definition to work with. 
All right, let me look and see if there are any more chats because it is now, and I don't even know how long we've been talking. It's 1130, so I'm a little short on time, but I'm certain you all probably won't mind that. These are the questions you're gonna be discussing. Before I turn it back over, are there any more chats? Um, it looks like there's one. Let me go back to my chat bar. Uh, we've developed a fair amount of chemical dependency evaluation and treatment and mental health services online. Such, again, I think it's a silver lining to a terrible pandemic because people are more receptive to doing the online and accepting. Let me suggest this. How many of you uh, before pandemic, even if you saw online services or a visit done virtually, which was really more unheard of, that someone might come to court and say, that doesn't suffice judge, that's not enough, that's not good enough, they need to do it in person. I think now we can have the dialogue about the reality is, you know, cell phones, our parent participation has been way up with virtual hearings. Our youth and children participation has been way up with, with uh, virtual hearings. So the reality is you can take your phone on your virtual hearing and you can at least eyeball whatever's in the room around them. So real advantage to that. So it does say to reach out to CIP to facilitate access to this online work when transportation or distance to treatment is a barrier. All right, I'm going to stop there and turn it back over to you. Oh, thank you. Uh that last comment was from me in response to the prior chat. We have, an, um, because Montana is very rural, a lot of our um, rural areas don't have any treatment providers. And um, so we have really developed uh, online groups, all sorts of things. We have seen really good outcomes. This has been occurring as well in drug courts across the state. So we have quite a bit of experience with that. So. If I guess I would say if your area doesn't have treatment providers and the department hasn't been able to develop those relationships uh, or distance has precluded that, um, CIP may be able to sort of help facilitate something else, okay, <laughs> an additional tool there. So what we are scheduled for is to, um, I believe, take a break now. Am I right, Julie? We're a little ahead of schedule, actually. Yeah, we're ahead of schedule. Our break isn't scheduled till 9.50. And so uh, we could take um, our break now and then come back and uh, we're, what we're going to do is uh, come back and break into teams and have some discussions about uh, what we've been doing for concurrent planning and uh, are there things we could do Bet better, what are our barriers to it? Why haven't we used it? Those type of things. So if we wanted to, why don't we go ahead and take right. 10 minutes to 15 and get some coffee, Julie? Right. I was just wondering if anybody had any questions for Judge Wilcott. At this point. Yeah, besides what was in the chat. Questions, comments before we take a break? It's a quiet group this morning. So we'll uh, go ahead and take, uh, what, why don't we plan on uh, 15 minutes? Will that work for everyone? Until 9.50. It's 9.35 now. So yeah, then we'll come back then and um, we'll divide up to chat. Uh, so enjoy your break. Right. Uh, it, at least my clock says it's 9.50, so we're going to get uh, going again. We are going to break out into our uh, various teams to have some discussion at this point in time. Uh, we would ask uh, when you break out, maybe get a note taker that's willing to take some notes and give us the highlights of what your group discusses that can copy and paste them into uh, the chat room. Uh, it's been very helpful the past trainings we've had to just get, you know, some ideas of what's going on in all of the different districts and the kind of things that uh, you all are seeing as important and uh, changes you might work on. Uh, we are going uh, to talk about a little bit, I mean, on your, when you're in your groups, we'd like you to take a look at, you know, what, what stood out from the definition of uh, concurrent planning to you, w would you change it? 
uh, do you think it's adequate? Uh, what what in your what in your mind would you like it to be if it if you don't particularly like our statutory definition of concurrent planning? Uh, and then uh, how to what extent are do you think you are using concurrent planning in your district or how what does it look like? And what are have been the barriers to having these discussions? And um, maybe some of the thoughts on how to remove those barriers, but what has concurrent planning really been much of an issue uh, and how has it been introduced in your judicial district? And so uh, Kevin's going to break us into various teams. I would ask that you do turn your cameras on, especially for these discussions uh, so that we can have some uh, interaction and we will be breaking out at about tw uh, for about 20 to 25 uh, minutes. So, Kevin, if you'd put us in a breakout. <clears throat> Looks like we're slowly getting folks returning from the breakout rooms. Uh, I had the, uh, I was in Judge Davies' group, and so uh, just kind of share some of the things that we talked about. Uh, I think the top barrier um, of course, like other breakout groups and room, we didn't necessarily talk just about the questions. And so we didn't uh, spend a lot of time talking about whether we liked our definition or not. Uh, we did discuss top barriers to talking about concurrent planning. And the number one being, um, you know, you don't want parents to feel like the cards are stacked against them at the get go. So there's been great reluctance to be uh, talking about those type of things when you know, uh, you're there saying, well, yeah, we're going to return your children, nudge, nudge, wink, wink, tell us uh, the name of all the people that we could place your children with. And so um, we had a lot of discussion of how we could, you know, introduce that topic so that it is seen more as a supportive uh, part of the process as opposed to um, we're, we've already got our minds made up. Uh, the other barrier uh, that was brought up is that a lot of times our placements are very reluctant over time or very slow to get licensed. And so, you know, like if you're doing a guardianship or something like that at the end game, that the licensing has to be done and the child there for six months before that can happen. And so a lot of times there are issues then we have a decent placement and we have that going on, but we have lots of delays with regard um, to that. So uh, I guess we'd like to hear from a, a couple of uh, other groups of uh, things that you discussed, uh, issues of um, the barriers that you have to concurrent planning. Uh, I don't know, I, saw, I see Judge Eddie, she's on my screen, so maybe we'll pick on her group. <laughs> Uh, you can pick on my group, but I defer to Jennifer Blodgett from the department because a lot of the conversation was about their new concurrent planning procedure that went into effect in May and just putting that into practice. So I defer to you, Jennifer. Sure. So we talked quite a bit around um, family engagement, um, parent engagement, um, how it's important to build the family trees and how we've been seeing some challenges in getting that participation from the beginning. Um, and then I presented our new um, procedure around concurrent planning. We're struggling to get that procedure started and moving in our area, but we are really working hard to get some um, pieces kind of solidified uh, to get that engagement moving from the very beginning. Jennifer, um, can you tell us what that is? I'm not sure people are familiar sure. with the new process that you're talking about? Sure, so it starts with a family engagement meeting where we discuss um, possible concurrent plans and bringing, um, and then having per, uh, permanency plan teams um, affect into every 90 days, which really bring together the team, including um, the state. So it's us, the worker, the CPS, our licensing folks, but also the parents, CASA, and anybody else that's really uh, critical for the children. 
Um, so maybe that could be a therapist or a school teacher, something like that. But really coming together every 90 days to discuss uh, permanency options for the children, um, which really kind of help some, it, it, in theory, it will help be transparent with the family around why we need this, but also bring them a part of that process as well. So um, we're working on getting some um, good systems in place in our area to try to get that FEM moving as quickly as possible. Um, so one of the things that we're starting hopefully today, uh, right now, we've got people in court right now, is uh, having that FEM referral being presented at our pre-hearing conferences so that we can start uh, talking through who their, who their people are and get them to the table as quickly as possible. Um, and really uh, trying to be as transparent as possible, what this process looks like, talking through ICPCs, all of these different pieces at the permanency plan teams, um, and having as many voices as we can for the children there as possible. So we're working through those pieces. It's not coming together as quickly as I would prefer, but it's, it is coming together. So that's what we've discussed. So Judge Gerada, how about we hear from your group? Um, so one of the things that we talked about as kind of a significant barrier is the ICPC process because of, you know, we start that sometimes early in the case, sometimes later in the case, but it's, it's quite a bit of work for the department and then the follow up on all of that and the delay can sometimes get lost and so a concurrent plan with an ICPC we do see as um, sometimes a barrier, but a lot of what you already touched on, Justice Gustafson, with regard to couching this in terms that it doesn't feel uh, as if we don't have hope in the parents moving forward, you know, saying things um, more along the lines of um, if something happened to you today, what would you want to see? Uh, for your kids moving forward, or where would you want to see your kids go, um, as opposed to if this fails and you don't um, get your act together, what are we going to do with your kids, right? Because we really want to inspire and give these parents hope, and I want to believe in them, and so it's, I need to start maybe asking uh, questions in different ways, and we were going to maybe reach out to our pre-hearing conference coordinators, Gabby and Cassidy, who I think are on here, and ask them if maybe they feel comfortable bringing up something along those lines at a pre-hearing conference um, and just ask it in a very delicate way so that everybody understands that, um, you know, we, we do believe in the parents, we do want them to succeed, but we also need to have uh, some other things moving along at the same time. You know, it's expecting, I think, a lot of our department workers to be, because uh, we're very short staffed, obviously, and I recognize how hard uh, the department works, especially in Yellowstone County, um, and asking them to, you know, plan a second option while they're trying to engage parents in the first plan is, is, a lot of work, but I think they can do it, and I'm really appreciative of all of the ideas that they brought to the table. All right. Well, uh, any other group thought that wants to chime in and uh, really thought you came up with some great ideas? Or before we go onward to uh, the second part of Judge Wilcott's presentation. This is uh, Dan Wilson. I'll volunteer the discussion from my group, the second team from Flathead County. And uh, I'm pasting in a summary of our comments now. Uh, I think there it goes. Uh, in our second team from Flathead County, the county attorney would like to see the term concurrent planning replaced by the term contingency planning because she believes this more accurately reflects what the law is actually seeking to accomplish. And it's a more accurate descriptor that the parents uh, would easily, more easily understand. Both are participating um, child and family services 
participant and the county attorney believe that the change in contingency planning or concurrent planning should be implemented by first the CPS discussing with the parents a backup plan at the time of removal of the child. Also a discussion among all the participants with the parents at the pre-hearing conference of uh, this topic and all the participants discussing with the parents at the family engagement meetings that need to have a backup plan in the event that things don't go well with the primary plan of reunification. And uh, they believe that this sort of early and constant effort uh, would serve to encourage what they believe is the parent's main obstacle to uh, fashioning a backup or concurrent plan, uh, the desire to avoid spreading their troubles in a case uh, to involve close family members and even acquaintances. All right. Well, thank you, Judge Wilson. It just sounds discussion. like you have a fairly comprehensive plan here. <laughs> so we are going to, uh, we're back right on schedule. And uh, I'm going to turn it back over to Judge Wilcott for the second uh, part of her uh, presentation. And then we will have another breakout uh, meeting and continue some of this conversation after that. 